Today I want to talk about something in the Bible that is a main. You know how like in this, any story there's the main theme and then there's just other themes. And this is a central theme of the Bible that I want to talk about. And we're going to start in Isaiah. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. Can you guys say liberty? liberty. These are big words. Liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound. This is the spirit of Jesus. This is his heart. And when I read this, it reminds me of one of my conversation starters that I like to use when I'm meeting people. Not just meeting, but getting to know them deeper. Because this isn't a first question when you meet someone, but maybe second, third. I love to sit and um, just ask questions. And often, as I'm getting to know people, eventually this will come up. Just curious, have you ever been... Um, in jail before. You know, you really get to know a lot about somebody. Because then if they have a story, I mean, you get to know, like, wow, how did you end up in jail? Um, I, I can tell you I've never been in prison, never been in jail. I don't think I've even been in detention. But <laughs> you know, Eric's all show off. I'm a very conscientious person. No. But I have been in something, even though I haven't been in prison, I have been in something called the corkscrew. And it's a story that I've told before, but it's the most that I could actually relate to that I think, gosh, when I read Liberty to those who are captive. Um, when I was in college, I went to a school in Santa Cruz, California. It's a beautiful place where the mountains come down to the ocean. And when I went there, I didn't know anyone. My sister went to school there. She was uh, not in the same um, realm of friends that I was in. But when I went there, you do new student orientation just to help you get to know the place and have little small group leaders. And I think on the third day, uh, my small group leader, one of them, said, hey, we're going to go splunking tonight if you want to come. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds like fun. What's splunking? You know, you're just like up for whatever. You know, you're starting a new season, and I like adventure. And he said, oh, it's caving. There's caves up in the mountains here, and we like to go at nighttime and uh, would love to have you. I'm like, that sounds like fun. So I remember we were like so excited. We got our flashlights and even had glow-in-the-dark stickers that we put on ourselves, and we're going to go have fun with my new friends. And um, we get up to the drive into the mountains. It's really dark. And, and at that point, I realized like, I don't know what kind of caves are we talking. And uh, I thought maybe it's just an opening in a mountain. You just kind of go in and then you come out. Like it's just something you see. And uh, we get up there and he said, yeah, you know, we're going to go in there. You're going to need your flashlights. And it's getting dark. You know, it's so dark that you can barely see. We get into the opening of the cave. And at that point I realized, hmm, I've only known these people for three days. It's dark at night. I'm in the mountains. There's probably eight of us. I'm like, I'm a pretty good judge of character, and we hope we made a good choice right now. So we start going into the cave, and it's a new experience for me. We are going for like a minute, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. I'm like, wow, this is a very long cave. Like, oh, yeah, it goes for miles all the way down to the ocean. I'm like, okay, I wonder how far we're going, you know? And we, as we're going, it actually split. So we went to the left. We climbed down something. And I'm just thinking, I better know how to get back because we've already made a couple different turns. And um, as we're going down, he said, we're going to come up to a spot called the corkscrew. And uh, we'll go one at a time. And uh, do you want to know why it's called the corkscrew? Yes, I do. I'm sure I'll find out. But yes, how, what's, why is it called the corkscrew? Well, it narrows down so small that we'll go one at a time, and um, you're going to put your hands above your head because it'll help you keep moving through this as it narrows down this small spot. And it is so small that um, at some point you'll, you'll hit something, you won't be able to continue moving forward, so you're going to have to turn your body like a corkscrew to keep moving forward. And I'm like, okay, that's, I've never done something like that before, so new adventure. Um, and I get in there and I am not claustrophobic. I'm like, I think I'm fine. The first person goes in, puts her hands over their head because you need the, the ability to kind of inch warm your way through. 
and I see them go in and their feet go through. They made it. And I'm calculating like the guy who has been there before is a little, is bigger than me. So if he can make it, I can make it. Wasn't worried. And um, I get in there, I put my hands over my head and I'm going and I'm, my body's probably almost all the way in it. And then I get stuck and I'm like, oh, my shoulder won't move. Oh, okay, this is what he's talking about. I have to turn so that I could keep going through. But at that moment, I realized maybe I don't like tight spaces so much because I wanted to move my shoulder and I wasn't able to. So I didn't freak out because I'm pretty good at calming myself down, but I had to breathe and I just breathe and turn. So we kept, I kept going, we kept going, me, myself, and I. And, and we were turning, <laughs> turning, and I slowly made it through the corkscrew. And I got to the other side, and I was like, wow, that was an, an experience. I didn't freak out, but it was probably the first time in my life where I could understand why someone would freak out. I, uh, because I wanted to move and take a deep breath and move my arms, but I wasn't able to. So I get out, and I said, oh, wow, okay, we did it. How are we getting back? We're going to go back through the corkscrew in a while. So I learned a lot about tight spaces. So even though I can tell you I haven't been in jail or prison, I have been in something called the corkscrew. And I want to tell you that God's will for your life is for you to be free. He cared so much about you being free that he gave his only son. Galatians 5.1 says, it's for freedom that Christ came to set you free. I'm like, that is what he has for us. So any space where we start to feel like we're in prison or not able to move freely, I just want to say that that is not what God has for us. God gave his life so that we could live in freedom, that we could freely receive love, give love, freely receive everything that he gave his life for and walk in the fullness of who he is. And so this morning, I'm going to talk about freedom. I do believe that God is inviting us into something new. He's always inviting us because God provides. And as he's provided, he's growing, forming, and shaping different things inside of us. And so we're going to go into the space of freedom. Are you guys okay with that? So thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you for your heart. I thank you, God, that your love is so great. Yeah, that you gave your only son. Yeah, that we don't need to live in any prisons. We don't need to leave, live in any bondage, God. And I pray, Lord, that you would just come and fill us with your spirit this morning, that you'd open up our ears and our eyes that we'd be able to see you and hear you. Yeah, thank you, God. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. There's a picture I love to show. that I was reading a magazine once, and I looked at this, and I was like, oh, I'm inspired right now. I see this little girl, and she's wearing her swimming suit, She's playing most likely in a sprinkler or the rain. And it says, remember her. She is still there inside you waiting. Let's go and get her. And it, what it reminded me, if you just look at her face, the expression, um, you see her squinty eyes, her mouth is open wide. I just see pure passion, joy, and delight. Someone who isn't um, numbed by hiding or afraid of what anyone else thinks. They're just enjoying what God is providing and enjoying just the delight of being alive. And I see that and I'm like, that's how I want to be. And we're all unique and different. And sometimes just in culture, there's some things that are more desirable than other traits that we might carry that sometimes we forget how beautiful it is that God has made us and how wonderful it is just to be able to delight in who he is inside of us. So as we follow him and as we grow and mature, my prayer is that we become more free and more who God has created us to be in his image. So that's what we're going after. So throughout our lives, we are constantly growing and changing. Sometimes along the journey, we experience things that shut us down, stunt our growth, or even trap us. Often, our own bodies become the prison. Our thoughts, our past experiences, our disappointments, our hurts, or our responses to hurt. Offenses, bitterness, hatred, comparison, rejection. We internalize so much of this, but we were never meant to live underneath the weight of sin and judgment. Those are the things that in areas we don't realize that we're, getting, we're trapped and not fully able to be who God is inside of us and who the grace that he's given us because we have let other things come in throughout the journey. 
See, the Bible says that we're in a war, that we're in opposition, that he has a plan for our lives, but so does Satan. See, there's a war for our souls and there's a swirl that tries to derail us from what God has for us. And I like for us to be aware of it, even as those of us who love God and are following God, that we wanna be mindful and aware that there is a war and that we are called to steward what he's given us. Today, I want us to be aware that there's multiple plans for your life. John 10.10 10 says, the thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that may, they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Right here in the scripture, you can see there are multiple plans for your life. It just depends who you wanna to listen to. And it's important that we're aware of this because I have experienced and witnessed so much swirl in the past month, month and a half in people's lives. And I'm talking as people who are following Christ, who want to grow and want to be like him. We all need to be aware of what is going on and who we're listening to. Ephesians 6, chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. I love these instructions, and I feel like this is a time where we get to grow in how we're walking and how we're stewarding. Verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And I want to stop right there. It says his mighty power. Do you guys know that God is mighty? Like the one who we're singing and worshiping, this is not just a little thing like, oh Lord, maybe you could help me. Like there is nothing like God and his spirit inside of us and what we have access to and what we can walk in. The reason we pray for people that are in starting new things, I'm like, oh, you need to be filled with his power and you need to be full of his spirit because he is mighty. That his mighty power, verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you may take your stand against the devil's schemes. In the last month and a half, I feel like I have seen a lot of scheming. It comes in many different forms, but I can tell even just as I'm listening to people and what they're navigating, I'm like, there is a swirl around you. You should be careful what you're listening to because I can feel scheming going on. <laughs> and I don't, I don't even have to be really discerning. I'm just listening, I'm like, oh, it feels actually very clear as day right now. So stand against the devil's schemes for our struggles, not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Can you say stand? And after you have done everything to stand. It's really interesting. He didn't say so you can sit down or you can lay down. These act, we're actually called to stand. And so for us to be able to stand and continue to stand, we need to be aware that there is a war and that we are called to stand, but we need to be aware that there is scheming and there is things that are going to try and derail us. And I love to, when I'm navigating things and making decisions, I love to ask, God, what is mine? What is yours and what is theirs? Because as we're stewarding things, those are things we have to figure out what is ours to actually be responsible for. And especially when there's scheming and swirling going on. So stewardship, we're responsible to create the life that we want to live. We're responsible to steward what God has given us. And we're responsible for what we do with it. That's why I love being in a space of courageous people. Because we're all given different things, but it's the courageous ones that actually do something with what's been given to you. And I'm inspired by that. So what is mine? What is God's? And what is theirs or yours? In the Bible, we're likened to a house and to good soil. House, do you know that the Bible calls us a dwelling place? A dwelling place for his spirit. Um, we're also a temple, a house. And the thing about owning a house is you get to decide if you want your doors open, if you want your doors shut, if you want to lock your doors, how clean you want to keep your house. I mean, there's a lot of stewardship in owning a house. And, I, and I, I can relate a lot to that just in what God has called us to steward and who he's created us to be. Because we can leave ourselves fully accessible to a lot of good things and bad things, depending on how we steward ourselves and our mind. 
In Matthew 12, they also um, were referred to as good soil. That when we hear the word of God, what does it fall on? And see, our th- word of God, different things, thoughts, they're like seeds. Do you know that everything in nature begins with a seed? And so if we understand that, and we understand that our lives, our hearts, our soil, then what seeds are we allowing to come into our soil and to grow? Really important things as we stepping into freedom. I do believe that God is maturing us and strengthening us so we can stand and walk in through different things. But we get to choose what we allow to take root in our soil. I have been baffled the last few months. I mentioned just noticing and experiencing a lot more swirl around me. But I have witnessed people that have acted, are are experiencing some level of being bound and witnessing them being bound and then behaving out of their nature, like different than I know them to be and then different than I know they want to be. That is a symptom of like, oh no, we should be, be careful what you're partnering with. When you start seeing things in your own behavior, like how did I end up here? Oh, I was just on autopilot. Eric and I were driving the other day and we were driving somewhere else to a nursery and we almost ended up here. And I was in, I was a passenger in the car and I know where we were going. Then all of a sudden, like two blocks or three blocks down, I'm like, where are we going? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, this is not where we're going. But do you know in life, it can be like that sometimes when you're not paying attention, you're like, I'm just doing my stuff. But in it, something, you started to partner with something and maybe it started out innocent. Maybe it was just a simple, I feel a little rejected. They didn't invite me to the dinner party. I'm like, that's fine. That just passes through. Do you know that seeds can get passed by just wind blowing, rain coming, an animal coming by and carrying a seed to a different spot? So seeds can come into our life many different ways, not even just by intentionally planting them. But then we have to decide what are we going to do with them? So we experience a hurt or like, gosh, I, I feel rejected whether I realize it or not. Perfect time for the enemy to come in and go, wow, you weren't invited yeah, they don't really like you. You're kind of ugly too, you know, and uh, you're really not that nice. They really probably only invited nice people to their dinner. Who do you think that thought came from? The devil, someone, someplace really hurting and sad. I'm like, once I hear that, I can not think about it. I could think about it more. I can come against it with something that could be more true. Like, oh, maybe I didn't get invited. That was true. You feel hurt. Yeah, that is true. Oh, you're, you, you're not very kind either. And you're not very good looking or pretty. That's they probably invited those kind of people. I'm like, hmm, what does God say about me? That's a great thing to ask when you start going a little further down the road in this space. Second Corinthians 10, chapter 10, verse three through five says, for though we walk in the flesh, We do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That's what we do. We stop and we say, what is the truth and what are lies? And it changes really fast from one thing to the other. Because the truth might be, I wasn't invited to the party. The truth might be, I am sad. But then from then on, starts the swirl. And I cannot, knowing, I need to know what truth is. Oh, God says I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God says that he chose me and loves me so much that he gave his only begotten son so that I might be saved, that I might walk in freedom. Do I know what God says about me? Because that's what should form and shape me. So that I'm not going down and getting messed around with by the swirls of thought. In ancient times, strongholds were tall towers built within the walls of a city to protect residents if the walls were breached. Strongholds, this says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And strongholds are a big thing. I think even as followers of Christ, there are things in our lives we don't realize that we've entertained and partnered with, and they became so normal, they're just strongholds in our life. And it takes us learning truth and actually asking the Holy Spirit to even show us, are there areas in my life that maybe I'm living bound 
and I don't even realize it. Because we're called to be free and called to be able to, to live out everything that Jesus gave his life for. That was our freedom. And how do strongholds happen? I think they begin in simple things. Their thoughts are entertaining thoughts. It can come as simple or as um, innocent as being discouraged, something that causes us pain, or something where we're fearful or sad, rejection, even just delayed results just makes us, those things can make us vulnerable. And depending how we respond, it's like owning a house and just opening your door saying, come on in, whether you're here to rob me or you're here to be good. Like you're just, we're opening ourselves to anything. So what can we do? Our mind is like a garden. And what we, what we're growing is we're going after Lord. We want to be rooted in his love, walking in truth and freedom. But weeds, I want to talk about weeds for a moment. A weed is a plant considered undesirable in a particular situation, growing where it conflicts with human preference, needs, or goals. Goals. So during the fast, uh, Eric and I, he mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but we were, uh, we've been working on our yard. We have a little, um, little like 2.3 acres. And in South Carolina or in Greenville, when they were building newer homes, our home is like seven years old, but um, they just clear off the land so much of it. So we have this beautiful forested area that's not forested. It just had nothing on it. And so we just bought our 98th tree to plant on our property, but in it, we're cultivating the land. And um, the thing is, is once you clear everything out and you don't plant anything, do you know what grows? Weeds, things I do not want. So you're going to see some passion. So during the fast on that Friday morning, we were out clearing out a space in our backyard, a very pretty big space because we're going to cover it with mulch and I wanted all the weeds gone. And, um, and we had different methods on how we uh, weeded, but I'll get into that later. Um, but I was thinking just sitting there, like, where do weeds come from as I'm taking all this time to pull it out? And they're just seeds that come, and then over time, it gets rooted. And the longer it's been there, it just gets rooted and established. And if you want them out, you have to, you want to get it out by the root and the thing that might bother us is what we see on the surface. But even if I were just to chop it off, it does nothing. It's just dealing with the surface, and it will come back very soon. Um, but if we want to grow and cultivate who God has called us to be, we do need to address and deal with the other things that are popping up in our lives because we are called to cultivate and to steward who God's created us to be. And he does call us good soil and our hearts good soil. So I wanted to ask us this morning, what are you growing in your life? And I say this even as followers of Christ, that we are responsible for what we're growing. And some things we might not be intentionally plant, but they still grow. Like in California, we have poison oak. I know here there's poison ivy, but I've never planted poison oak and it still grows on my property. So even things that in our lives, maybe situations that we've gone through that we didn't cause, but we still got impacted by them. Sometimes we still have to go after them and address them. Like poison oak, if you want to get rid of it, you've got to get goats or you better set it on fire and be careful not to breathe too much of it in if you're allergic to it. Um, but it is very uh, aggressive and invasive species. And so there's some things that come to kill, steal, and destroy that are in our lives. It could be something that happened to you as a child, but you still are dealing with the consequences of what happened to you because of how you responded to it. And so this morning, I've, we get an opportunity to step into another level of freedom. And understanding thoughts can come from a lot of places. Thoughts can come from us. Thoughts can come from demons. Thoughts can come from the pit of hell. Thoughts can come from other people. Do you know that I walk into places and I can feel, I get thoughts in my head and I know they're not from me. And it could be thoughts of insecurity. And I'm like, oh, wow, I think that person is really insecure. And I'm, I have a thought in my head, and I don't think it was from me. But I get to choose what I do with that thought. I, can, I don't have to be insecure. I don't have to go, oh, gosh, you must have done something wrong, Candace. No, you're fine. You're fine. You are loved. 
you um, are fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm like, just move along. So just because we think it doesn't mean that we have to entertain it. So what do we do if we notice there might be patterns in our life that are unhealthy or strongholds? How do we break them? I have a list of four things. I know that there are others, um, but I love us being aware of this so that we can begin to go after those things in our life. The first one is so simple, but it's with those thoughts and ideas. Stop agreeing with them. Super, super simple um, is taking those thoughts into captive, taking them captive and not dwelling on them. Um, Stop agreeing with it. Repent, trust God would be in that as well. And see, here's the thing about how Eric and I went after the weeds differently. On the hill, there's a section that we are going to put steps up eventually, but I wanted all the weeds gone before we put mulch over it. So I was on my hands and knees. I have a little tool that gets the roots out. And then I had a shovel and a rake. And um, it took me a very long time, but I got all the roots out. And um, even a week and a half, two weeks later, I was, we were spreading mulch this weekend. And in that section, there's still almost no weeds because I took the time to pull the roots out. And some roots were really thick um, and big because the plant was really mature. And some had lots of little roots going down, but taking the time and pulling them out. And then Eric on his section, which is both of our backyard. <laughs> the weeds are both of ours. He wants me to clarify But the other section, he covered a lot more ground, but he took a weed eater and just got it down to like the lowest form so that we could just put mulch over it. But I want to tell you, a week and a half later, those weeds are getting bigger. Um, And I'm like, I got to cover them with mulch, get the sunlight off of those babies. Um, So just when we notice things in our life, sometimes just acknowledging them or even picking the top off isn't enough. We need to go back and instead of just going, I don't know why I always feel rejected. I don't know why. I'm like, well, when did that start? Oh, well, actually, when I was a child, I didn't, actually, I didn't feel loved by my parents. Or I didn't feel, there could be a lot of reasons, and a lot of times it's not even our fault. But when we go one step deeper, it's actually like getting to the root of it and saying, God, I want to know your love in that place. And like, how did you feel about me in that place? But that's where we start really getting, seeing transformation and healing at a deeper level. So we're not taking that along with us our entire life. Do you guys want to be that free? And like, these are things that you can come to church and worship God, but like, what are, how are you living your life? Are you, did you stop using your arms like 15 years ago and you didn't, you didn't realize it? That you're just living your life and carrying your body around and your mouth sounds great, but you actually aren't full functioning and fully free on who God, who God is inside of you. That's the stuff that God's inviting us into that level of freedom. So how do we break strongholds? We stop agreeing with them. Super simple, bringing it to the Lord. And the secondly is bring it to the light. This one is huge. For whatever reason, we made up this construct that as long as people don't know about it and we don't deal with it or talk about it, that it isn't there. I'm like, it's so, you couldn't be further from the truth that it um, is going to torment you for the rest of your life until you can take it out of the shadows and say, can I confess something to you? Because this is no longer going to have a hold on me. And there's um, scripture, I love this. It says in James 5, 16, in the message translation, says, make this common practice. Confess your sins each to each other and pray for each other so that you can live together whole and healed. Everything inside you says, keep the struggle a secret. Wear a mask. Hide the pain. And God says just the opposite. Satan plays in the shadows and secrets. God lives in the land of the light and honesty. So let's bring our stuff into the light. It's one of the best and easiest ways to just bring exposure and get freedom. And then third, forgive. Forgiveness is so huge. That's where we get life. Because God's forgiveness, we don't live underneath the weight of sin and judgment. So we get to offer that to each other when we forgive. And when we don't forgive, All it does is bind us up. I've sat with many people over the years, and I've sat with people that are 60 years plus, and they will tell me, you know, gosh, I don't know why I can't get breakthrough in this one area. It's plagued me my whole life since, da-da-da. I'm like, since when? Okay, well, what happened? And so often the issue is 
wow, this pain happened and I don't forgive myself. I don't forgive them or I don't forgive God. And you know, it does just binds it all up and it just torments them for the rest of their life. So we can break that really easy by just saying, God, I ask for forgiveness or I release forgiveness. When we do that, we freely receive and we freely give and we live in freedom. And that's what we have access to. And then lastly, that we would know and walk in the authority that Christ gave. He gave his disciples authority. He walked in authority. Do you know what he did while he was on the earth in his ministry? He healed the sick. He cast out demons. That was common practice for Jesus. And then he tells those that he called, now I want you to go and do the same. In Matthew 10, 1, it says, when he called the 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Do we know the authority that we've been given? Knowing it's one thing, the other is accessing it. We don't have to be continually ta taunted and tormented by things that come to kill, steal, and destroy because we have been called to freedom. So it's time to break off self-preservation, to blow past embarrassment of what people might think. Jesus cared enough. He cared enough about our freedom to give his life. So let's step into the light and be fully free, known and loved. You no longer need to be tormented by fear and anxiety. God gave us authority over it. There's spirit and physical, and God wants us to be completely free in both arenas. Roots take time, and young weeds are easy, easier to pull out. The older ones are more established, and they get big. So let's not wait, and let's do something today. So where are we headed? We're headed to freedom. We're headed to be rooted and established in love. My favorite is John 8, verse 31 through 32 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed to him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then it continues in verse 36. Therefore, the Son, of, uh, the Son makes you free, and you shall be free indeed. God's will for our lives is freedom. And we do not, we are not to stop and call it good. And not to stop and say, oh, but I'm functional. It's okay. I don't actually need to move this part of my body. I'm like, oh no, he created you to do wonderful, dynamic things. We don't want to be resigned to be stuck in a prison and call it good. I know it's good to say, how are you? And we're used to saying, I'm good, I'm fine. How about let's call things like they are? How are you? I want to be good, but I'm trapped right now. And I know this is not God's will for my life. What if we got a little more honest? I love Ephesians 3. Verse 16 and 19 through 19, this prayer is beautiful and this is my prayer for all of us. It says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory. Even that makes me feel safe. His glory. It's not even dependent on me. That he would grant us according to his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell. Can you say dwell? Dwell. Because we are a temple, we are a house, and there's gonna be something that fills our house. That he, Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. So what I wanna leave us today with are three questions. I wanna ask you, what are you growing? And even as followers and lovers of God, what are you actively grown? Are you aware? Things that we can see and maybe things we can't see. And then secondly, what are you watering or feeding? Because whatever you are, it will get bigger. <laughs> what thoughts are you meditating on? Are they truths or are they fears or are they thoughts that bring life or death? What are we watering and feeding? And then lastly, what is keeping you from being fully free? Why don't you stand with me?